morning. Um, I am delighted to be here, but when I say that, you should take that with a grain of salt. Uh, I hate flying, (laughs) so I'm delighted to be anywhere the plane lands safely, you know. (laughs) So it could be anywhere. But I've got to tell you that I am grateful to Doris in the back because I would have said I'm delighted to be here in Tacoma had she not told me that this is Lakewood. <laughs> and, and having done that in St. Paul, saying I'm delighted to be here in Minneapolis. Uh, and, and those of you who know in the old days that that was really a faux pas, I'm delighted to be here in Lakewood <laughs> and, to sh- and to be grateful for what I've learned uh, from friends and colleagues in Tacoma. Uh, and I hope that uh, for the folks who have worked with us and walked with us in the campaign for grade level reading, they will feel that we did learn something. And let me share with you that I've been off the road, like many of you, for, for two years. I'm just getting back. So this notion of a keynote intimidates me. And I was even more intimidated when I had a chance to see Jeff Canada a couple uh, weeks ago. Jeff has not lost a step. He is as fierce an advocate, as powerful a speaker, and as inspiring a leader as he was five years ago, 10 years ago. Pandemic didn't slow him down a bit. I find myself less sort of interested in the keynote and more committed to figuring out how we reflect together, how we learn together with and from each other. And I'll tell you, uh, I had this great conversation with Jessica and Tanya. And as I was listening to them talk about the work that you're doing in Pierce County, I was absolutely fascinated. And as I listened to the CEO of United Way talk about what this county and this region did to respond to the pandemic, I was moved to ask a question. Who knows the story? Because there are stories here that need to be told and really need to be heard by folks all across the country. And I'm not just saying that because Jessica and Tanji will tell you that shortly after I got off the phone with them, just to prove that no good deed goes unpunished, Uh, we had them over the weekend commit to doing a webinar with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading uh, in two weeks. So this notion of taking what you learn here and sharing it with our network and with others is very real to me. And as I'm coming back on the road, I'm trying to figure out how I do more of that and less of what I was doing before. So what you're going to get is a sort of a, you know how sometimes they tell you the salad is, what, deconstructed? You know, you go to a fancy restaurant and to add a few dollars to the salad, they deconstruct it, which means they don't have to do the extra work of putting it together. So you're about to get a deconstructed presentation that no one has heard before, and it's going, it's going, we'll put a lot of pieces together, and you're going to have to do some work. Uh, remember they said, don't laugh, you're, you're next. You're up next. But let me, I'm going to begin with two slides that I have framing how I'm beginning to think and do some work, and I hope this is going to, these are going to be relevant to you. So I'm going to ask, and you can imagine that Jessica and Tanya and others had to deal with the fact that 
My partner in crime raising those sides is going to be Rolf, and I'm Ralph. So what you're about to see is a production by Rolf and Ralph. And I'll ask Rolf to put up the first slide because this, this, is, a important, this is important and it'll explain a bit. Six years ago, here's the background to this slide. Six or maybe seven years ago now, you know, we're all having problems figuring out some, whether something was five, six, or seven years ago, given the two year interruption of the pandemic. So six or seven years ago, we asked a number of communities in the network to do a data dive because we were picking up, you know, when you have over 300 communities, some things that seem like blips or weak signals or one-offs, with 350, you, when, you, when they recur, you begin to think that maybe you're spotting an early trend. And it felt to us that we were picking up a message about kindergarten. So we encouraged them to do a data dive. And we asked them to take a look at the young children who were in the fourth quartile of their kindergarten class at the end, at the end of kindergarten. And <clears throat> Tell us what they found. What they found as a result of the data dive were the children who were in the fourth quartile at the end of kindergarten were in the fourth quartile at the end of fifth grade, which means none of them hit the third grade reading milestone, not one. And that was consistent across several districts <clears throat> and really clear in the, the data we got from Denver and a few others. So we thought we had hit something, hit on something, and we went out with an initiative called Focus on the Fourth, focus on the most vulnerable children and make sure that they get the supports they need so that their destiny couldn't be foretold by the end of kindergarten. The response of the philanthropic community was a yawn. And a good friend of mine who uh, is still in leadership and uh, says she has no recollection of this, basically said, data dives are not, that's not research. Because traditional researchers think that unless you have a cohort study or an RCT, this is not research. Now, these people are being made obsolete by the era of big data. But we're now talking about seven years ago when data was still, uh-uh. So some of our funders went out and did the research and paid for the cohort study and paid for the RCT. Here's the result of a cohort study. That when you look over on the far left, you see that the lowest income children enter kindergarten with a six point deficit between their performance and their more affluent peers, six points. Second thing you could notice from that, and you could, you could ask why is that? What accounts for that? And, some of the explanations are pretty obvious. You know, the adversities of poverty impose a toll and bring costs. Now look at what happens during kindergarten. That six point gap grows to 11 by the end of kindergarten. This is what we had picked up seven years ago that there is that gap at the end of kindergarten. And look at what happens when they leave kindergarten. That that gap at the end of kindergarten endures. So we know for a matter of fact at the end of kindergarten which children are not going to hit the third grade reading milestone. And we know for those children early school success is going to be elusive 
And we know for children who, for whom early school success is elusive, so is later school success, so is high school graduation, so is any chance of an escape from generational poverty. We now have the research that confirms the data. So the campaign for grade level reading just had to make a change. We started out saying that we would not get into schools, that we would support schools. And we listened to teachers over the years who answered this question this way. <clears throat> we asked those teachers, suppose the common quote really was adopted. And suppose we had more uniform and rigorous standards that undergirded powerful curriculum, inspiring instruction, pertinent, relevant, and timely professional development, and real assessments that provide the data for making decision making. Suppose we had that. And suppose we also invested and had the kind of school level leadership that principals bring to create a culture that's conducive to learning. Would that combination be sufficient to narrow the gap between low income students, and by saying low income students, we mean the students whose parents are low income, so we, the children of economically challenged, fragile, and marginalized families. Would, would that combination be sufficiently powerful? The teachers uniformly answered, no, that won't close the gap. We need help to pay attention to those things that are happening outside the school and outside the classroom. And they pointed our attention to the fact that a large number of students who were missing the third grade reading milestone were children who came to school already so far behind that given the, resource configure, the resources and how schools are configured, those kids would not catch up. That the kids who needed the most school often got the least because for a set of reasons they had the highest level of chronic absence. And so it wouldn't matter so much what happened during school because the kid wasn't there to benefit from it. And thirdly, that you know summer is always that delicate dance between risk and opportunity. And that for a number of families, summer it was a risky, risky time. And without schools, and schooling during the summer, many of those same kids returned to school in September, farther behind than when they left in June. And so those three populations of students really became the target of action and the focus of action for the campaign for grade level reading. And we were comfortable saying that as a campaign, we were not gonna get in that long line telling teachers what to do we're not gonna get inside the school, but we're gonna work on helping schools by trying to organize communities to find solutions to get, that would help to get more kids ready for school, that help to get more kids attending school every day, and that would really take care of kids during the summer, stop the summer slide, and prevent summer learning loss. That's how we organize the campaign, knowing that individual communities didn't have the luxury of staying out of schools, and many campaigns were working really closely with schools. But we tried to remain, and did remain, agnostic. This data now says we can no longer be agnostic, that kindergarten is now an inflection point. And those of us who care about kids' success have to care about kindergarten and have to figure out how we intervene, support, challenge, interrogate what's going on in those early years to make sure that by the time 
children leave kindergarten, they have at least a chance at early school success. So for, for us, this slide is confirmation, but we're not taking a victory lap saying, we told you so. This slide essentially raises the bar for us. And I want to share this slide because we're having intense conversations in communities around the country saying, can you look at your data? Look at what's happened to your kids who left kindergarten behind. And is this their experience or is the experience something different? And we are finding in school district after school district, this is the experience. And we think that by exposing this, that we can change the conversation and say if this is the point, if this is the inflection point, this must also be the point of intervention and support, that kindergarten is the first opportunity for at scale support and intervention. It is the first universal access point. It is where we can do more and where we ought to do more and it feels as if we are failing uh, badly at the outset. So I wanted to put this on because when I speak with you, that's, those thoughts are essentially generated by and responsive to what we're learning um, at the campaign for grade level reading. So, a second thing that we're learning at the campaign is that there's a significant confidence question. And this confidence question is important. And the backup to the confidence question is saying when we think about moving the needle on things like grade level reading, we knew at the outset that we needed at least three key assurances. One, quality teaching for every child in every setting, every day. And we said deliberately setting because we said home is a setting. Quality teaching for every child in every setting, every day. And that's why we are all continuing to be interested in the, in, the debate, in the emerging debate about the science of reading, the science of learning, the science of teaching. And there are lots of views on that. And if we get a chance, we could talk about that. But we don't, we don't have to. Everybody else is. The second thing uh, we knew is that for children of economically challenged, fragile, and mobilized families that we needed more seamless systems of care and supports. And the third, and thirdly, we needed communities to be mobilized around solutions to get more kids ready, to get more kids showing up, to take care of kids during the summer. Over the last decade, in listening to communities again, we got this sense that there was a question that we weren't asking. There was something communities were trying to tell us. And in 2017, we kind of pieced it together, and here's the question. How confident are you that the children of economically challenged families in your community are receiving the services and supports for which they're eligible. Notice we take the policy question out. We say for which they're eligible are receiving the services and supports for which they're eligible in the appropriate, in the correct sequence at the appropriate do dosage 
and for the necessary duration. Sequence, dosage, duration. How confident are you? And so this is the first, this is your first participation opportunity. And I'm not gonna give you five minutes, I'm gonna give you three. At your, at your table, uh, decide how confident are you. Very confident that that's happening, somewhat confident that that's happening, or not confident that it's happening for children of economically challenged families here in Pierce County, or you could do the state of Washington. Go, you got three minutes, how confident? As for a show of hands, at, at which table uh, votes, which table was there a consensus that you're very confident that that's happening uh, in this county or state? Don't see many hands, don't see any for hands. How many folks are somewhat confident that that's happening? I see one table. Essentially, this is what we get across the country. 80 to 90% of folks confronted with this question and the people who are closest to the issues, people who are most passionate, people who, for whom this is their life's work, we are not confident that despite all the advocacy, despite all the progress, that the kids we ought to care most about are getting the benefit of the wins. Because remember, we start with kids who are eligible. This is a win. And we're not confident that they're getting the services and the supports in the correct sequence, at the appropriate dosage, <clears throat> or for the necessary duration. That is something profound because we are somehow operating with the knowledge that every day in many ways, our efforts are being undercut despite the wins. And that lack of confidence will continue to be corrosive because we, we, we know that it's not happening. We know it's not real. We know that we're not really solving the problem for a whole lot of kids. What we've found as a campaign is that we've got to solve that problem and that for children of economically challenged families, that we need to insist on systems of care, services, and support that are 24, 7, 365, and multi-generational. 24, 7, 365, and multi-generational. And that is why the campaign for grade level reading for the last decade has reached out and is still reaching out, seeking to bring to the table and include in all of these conversations the leadership of public housing communities where so many of these students, uh, children live and where their families are, are served. Because what we know is the school-centric approach won't work because schools are not 24, schools are not seven, schools are not 365, and far too many schools are impatient with the notion that they have to be multi-generational. Let me make a, a digression here. A lot of folks are in teaching because they like kids a hell of a lot more than they like adults. <laughs> and that's not hard to understand why. So you can imagine the surprise and chagrin 
of these folks when you say, you have deliberately choose, chosen a profession where you're going to be underpaid, undervalued, because you like kids. And now we're telling you, we don't tell you this while you're teaching or while you're being prepared. Now we're telling you that these kids come attached to these troublesome adults that you don't like, and you've got to pay attention to that because we believe in family engagement. Now, now, this is essentially the message we're giving to teachers. And they're like, what? I didn't sign up for that. If I wanted to work with adults, I would have gone and gotten better paid. So we need to understand that we have got a fundamental mismatch here. And we need to do something more than just simply talk about family engagement. We've, not, we've, we've got to figure out how we build truly productive partnerships between and among teachers and parents. Because without those truly productive partnership, it's not likely we're going to succeed. Those of us who are parents, especially if we live in two-parent households, know that young kids are natural running backs. What does a running back do? Find the crevice. Find the daylight, and you run like hell into the daylight, right? And those of us who are parents know that kids are geniuses at playing us off. You know, my son calls me, calls me when I'm at work, and he says, Dad, can I do something? And I'm so glad that I feel so guilty that I'm not already home. I immediately say, yes, whatever it is he wants to do, that'll keep him busy and not have him realize I'm still at work and not home. Sure, do it. It takes about 30 seconds before my wife calls up and says, did you just tell him that he can go next door or where it is? Because she'd already said no. And he realized there was a little bit of distance, and he took advantage of that distance. The distance between the adults who were important to that kid, when it comes to a teacher and a parent, that distance is a chasm. Who can blame kids for, for doing what comes naturally? You run between them. So unless and until we create a relationship that is observable, a partnership that is observable to the, to the kids, it's, it's going to make the life of both those adults a whole lot more complicated than it is. And as we think about that relationship, what this is going to require us to do is to acknowledge, interrogate, and abandon the current, the prevailing narrative about parents who are low income, and especially low income parents of color. Here's the narrative that we don't say out loud, but that drives a lot of how we think and what we do how we behave. And that narrative is, you're poor, and in not so good circumstances, because you made bad decisions or poor choices, or exercised poor judgment with your own life. And so we can't fully trust you to make good decisions on behalf of your children. Now, we don't say that out loud, but we behave that way. And so we're going to say that, trust us that your kids need to be college and career ready. And we're going to have a, we got a program for that. In fact, we now have an app for that. You know, what we might want to do is to back up a little bit and figure out how we help parents to envision bold goals for their own children. Thank you very much. I have a friend who is providing college scholarships to the children of agricultural workers. <coughs> His Here's a family that owned a vineyard and was committed to the folks who work for them. 
and thought that what they could do is provide scholarships so these kids could go to four-year college. And they were frustrated that they couldn't get their parents to get excited about that. And it took a while before they got to understand that for parents who are agricultural workers, college is something over here. What they want is their kid to have a job that doesn't require them to work in the field. And they don't want to have to say, you'll have a job four years from now. They want, they want, it. They want something that's more concrete and more graspable now. And it took a while before they could refigure, reconfigure that scholarship program. Well, maybe we are talking not about a four-year college, we're talking about a community college credential. And the parents are like, oh, yes, that we want. And they reconfigured that program because our job is to help parents develop bold goals for their own children, not to substitute our goals for theirs and to afford parents the experience and the exposure that will inform the development of bold goals. And, and with those bold goals, our job is to help parents navigate toward those goals and figure out how we're the coach from the, from the side, how we do it by example, how do we do it? And be intentional about that. And then to help parents celebrate progress and success. That is not the way our field envisions our work. Our field envisions a work in a way that substitutes for parents and tell parents we know better than they do what's good for their kids. We don't say that, but we do it quite often. You know, that narrative about parents having make it, made, making bad decisions about their own lives and therefore not being entitled to make decisions on behalf of their children seeps into virtually everything we do. And, you know, I'll tell you a story about <laughs> one day uh, when I was commuting from Baltimore, uh, and this is a story about because I'm going to ask you each to tell each other one of your worst stories or one of your best stories about your worst moments as a parent. Those of you who are parents and those of you who are not parents, stand by. You're in for a laugh. Uh, you're, you're in for a big laugh. So I'm, I'm coming home from Baltimore, and I'm coming home at a kind of a funny time. My kid, who is six years old, is watching TV. My wife has to make it. She decides he's watching TV. He's not even going to know I'm gone. So she drives over to the train station, picks me up, and you know when you round the corner to go home, there's six cop cars surrounding my house. Uh, you know, lights flashing, everything going on. And I tell you, it was literally the scariest moment of my life. We get out the car and run to the house just in time for the sergeant to come out, look at me fiercely, and say, you know I could report you for leaving your child alone. You shouldn't do that. And he stalks off because he had just spent, he had six squad cars around my house. Now they had searched every inch of my house looking for that burglar, so I was really delighted that some of my friends who, who tend to travel with contraband were not staying with us at the time because <laughs> that sergeant was looking for any excuse he could to arrest me. Uh, he was so annoyed. But the annoyance of the sergeant aside, what I remember as a parent running toward that house and thinking that somehow we had made a tragic mistake and that something had happened to our child and that's why those cops were there. Now that was my worst experience as a parent. And I want you around the table to, to talk about your worst experience as a parent. And I'll tell you why I want us to do this. Because low-income parents think we are perfect, that we really got this thing together, 
that we know how to do it. And we don't tell them that we screw it up as often and as badly as they do. But we've got the resources, we've got a lot of stuff that bails us out. So what could be tragic for a low-income parent for us is just another slight inconvenience. And we live to tell the story, and we still have our kids. So I want you just to take a couple of minutes, go around the table, and tell your, tell, share what was your worst parenting mess up. Take, take a couple of minutes and do that. OK, I know. I know that you're only halfway around the table. I know you're only halfway around the table. Uh, but as you can tell, this is an exercise that could last the entire period. <laughs> because we all have stories to tell. And the first time I did this, it was in Northern California. and. A gentleman, at the ta a gentleman who was a participant came up with tears in his eyes. And he said, you know, I just told my story. And it was about leaving my kid in the car. Three times he had forgotten his kid in the car. And I think a number of us have done that, but, uh, by the way. But he wasn't the only one. But what for him was the insight? is he had made no connection between his forgetting his kid with the in the car than the blame that he placed on that parent every summer who leaves their car, who leaves their kid in the car while they go to work at Walmart or something else. You know that tragic story that happens every summer? The kid in the car that's 108 degrees? We all hear it. He had made no connection between his leaving his kids in the car and that low-income working parent who probably didn't have childcare, didn't have a lot of alternatives, and was using the car as a shelter for that child. The fact of the matter is, those of us who are now, never have been, or no longer are economically challenged, fragile, marginalized, need to afford a lot of grace and a lot of space to parents who are struggling without the resources we have to do the best they can for the kids they love. And if they sometimes mess it up, mess it up we ought to give them the grace and space to get it wrong and help create circumstances where they get it right. And one thing we could do is to share with them our stories. Is to say, oh, I have done something just like that so often. Because this way we don't other those parents. We embrace them as doing, as learning as we have. That parenting is the hardest job in the world for which most of us are totally unqualified. And we learn it, and we learn it the hard way by doing it. And some of us have the resources not to do it any better, but to protect against the consequences of doing it poorly. And that's why we have stories to tell that are poignant, but we can still laugh about. We've got to figure out how to share those stories with each other and share those stories with the parents who need to hear those stories. We have got to have a narrative that is driven by empathy and not so much by blame. And until we acknowledge interrogate and abandon that nar the narrative that now drives much of how we feel about parents. You know, the reason why there's such a thing as child poverty is because almost 50 years ago, 
ad advocates realize that low-income parents, both fathers and mothers, were so stigmatized that trying to get policy, family support policies, policies through was a non-starter. And so an affirmative decision was made to focus on the kids. You know why there's such a thing as the Harlem Children's Zone, which we all admire? It was because the Reedland Family Center, by just having the word family, was just not as fundable, not as deserving of empathy and support as the Harlem Children's Zone, even though the Harlem Children's Zone continued to serve the parents. You rarely hear about that. There is something fundamentally wrong when we have to, when we're trying to save children while jettison, while we jettison their parents. There's something fundamentally wrong about that, and we've got to figure out how we fix that. It's hard to say that good things came out of the pandemic, but they did. And one of the things, um, in talking to Donna from United Way last night, she says, what the pandemic confirmed for us is that we can do this. It's the we can meet this and figure it out. Well, she is so right about that because communities around the country invented and innovated you know, amazing things. And what we've got to do is to realize that the status quo is, is powerful elastic and that elasticity could take over and we could spring back very quickly and we're seeing some evidence of that. But the three, th three things that came out the pandemic and you can say, finally getting <laughs> to this. Three things. One, digital equity has become real. The digital divide has been around for a generation. And when school closed and went digital, we realized that the digital divide was real, that dig digital equity was a thing, and digital connect connectivity is essential. Digital con connectivity is like attendance, everyday attendance. If you don't have it, you might as well be absent because you are. And so it's changed our work and it's changed the work of a lot of folks. We, as w the reverse exodus back to homes, reminded us and reminds us all that parents matter. Because whether you were in college or in childcare, where did you go? Back home to your parents. And so we know for, for a fact, if we only suspected, that parents matter and parents must be seen as essential partners in the overall well being and progress of their kid. Really important. And what we also know is in the first weeks of the pandemic that across the nation when schools closed, teachers were focused on figuring out how kids got fed, not on hotspots and laptops. That came later. And so it reminded us that schools are multi-service, multitask and centers. We may still call them schools, but Schools are the childcare institutions for school-aged children. And if those institutions close, people can't go to work. That's childcare. Schools are where we feed kids or where they get their health care. And we now know that where they form communities that are protective of their mental health. We now know that schools are sources of resilience and that something happens to kids when we don't provide them the opportunity to learn and grow and develop together. And now we are rushing mental health resources to fill, to fill that gap. 
And what we also know is that schools is what we've said all along, but what we know, schools can't do it alone. That if we're going to have and see a academic recovery, if we're going to see progress, if we're going to deal with the mental health challenge, it must be the whole community. And that is why the Campaign for Grade Level Reading has essentially learning from all around the country and now learning from the work that's being done here. And this is what brings me here. And this is what will bring uh, Jessica and Tanya to our entire audience on May 2nd. By the way, tune in on May 2nd. It would be great if everybody tuned in. It would give us another 100 people, and it would really confirm the stardom uh, of the folks who are going to be representing your work. Let me see that. Ralph, let me see that second slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're trying to, and this will echo and resonate with the work you did here. And my in initial thing was to spend all the time on the slide, but this is so much part of the DNA of this community that telling you this for 40 minutes would have been preaching to the choir. What we think we're gonna try to do is to knit together things that are already going on and try to say, how do we build a system that gives us a whole that's more than the sum of the parts? How do we build in a quarter century of work uh, from the after school program? a century of experience by public libraries. And as we think about this, and this is still in process, so don't look at pretty arrows and circles or what, I think it's done, because Rolf will tell you that I think this arrived yesterday afternoon. We, have, we, we change this every day. This is, this is subject to input every day, and my team didn't allow the most recent one to come until they were able to get the graphic designer to, to inc include two more words. Uh, so we didn't need the words. But when you look at the left, what you see is that this notion starts with home. How do we help parents create learning-rich environments in their home? And in some cases, that starts with book provision and the like. But everybody who interacts with, that, with, with those parents, whether they're WIC nutritionists, pedi pediatricians, home visitors, you think about everything that goes to the, interacts with the parents and interacts with the home should have a component that says home has to be a learning rich environment. That's where kids should learn to read. That's where they should learn to love reading. That should be the space. It should be the place where parents get exposed to number sense. And if they get exposed to number sense, their math anxiety gets lowered. And if their math anxiety gets lowered, and how do we do that? By really seeing whether we could use literacy as a way to lower anxiety about numeracy. And there's some work going on. Because virtually every chil children's book, you could, you, the apples are green but they're five apples, and the kids have, and this is why there's this debate between math and literacy about which is more predictive. The fact of the matter is, math is more predictive, but we won't know that if the kid can't read. So <laughs> reading is still the gateway skill, but kids at 18 months have a theory of set, have a set theory. They can tell you which is larger, which is smaller, which is more, which is less. Just look at how and follow their eyes. There's a lot of pre-math that we can detect at 18 months when we can de de detect very much about literacy. The brain doesn't make that distinction, we do. So home is where things really could happen and we ought to be intentional about that. On the far right, this is the everyday places and spaces which you're already doing. Every place that parents go with kids, or every place that kids go, we, our question is, is this a learning rich environment? And if I take longer than a minute, there's a hook that's going to come and drag me off of this stage, and I just got the one minute. See, I told you I wouldn't let you get away with that. Uh, and 
the, the last, and this is really the, the, the last circle at the bottom, is think about, again, think about us. Think about the museums and the libraries and the orchestra. Think of all we d have done to ensure our, the, that what happens at school for our kids gets supplemented and augmented by the institutions and organizations and assets within our community. And many of those institutions and assets uh, seem remote, unavailable, inaccessible, and unwelcoming to parents. And here, and this, and this is, we can finally get back to the sweet spot. And here in Pierce County, you have taken up and taken on this set of issues. And it is beautiful to hear about, to learn about it, to watch. And we think people ought to know that. That this is how we're trying to think about accepting this notion and building around the, the realization that schools cannot do it alone. We have more children standing on the edge of a cliff on the wrong side of an even larger set of gaps. If we are to do something about that, it must be because we've decided that we're going to do it together, and we won't expect schools to do it alone. And what you're doing in this community is really important. It's an important exemplar of that message. It is truly important work, and I am honored to have the opportunity to be here today to say that to you on behalf of the network of 350 communities that comprise the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you all.